I'm very honored to to welcome our final keynote here uh, in this space, in this uh, this last plenary here um, at at the Wicked's conference, um, and and we're joined by uh, Professor Linda Martine Alkoff, who is professor of philosophy at the City University of New York. She earned her PhD at Brown University after doing undergraduate work at Florida State University and Georgia State University. Her books include Rape and Resistance, Understanding the Complexities of Sexual Violation, in which her conception and use of sexual subjectivity has been particularly useful for me personally, and I'm sure for many others, um, as I continue to think through what justice might look and feel like for survivors of sexual violence. Uh, she's also written The Future of Whiteness, uh, which has had a powerful impact in the field of critical whiteness studies and questions whiteness's future and importantly challenges white exceptionalism. Uh, Alkoff's other books include Visible Identities, Race, Gender, and the Self, which won the France Fanon Award and made a powerful argument for the importance of social identities and their visibility uh, to plural pluralistic and ethical political life. And her final book, Real Knowing, New Versions of Coherence Theory. Prof. Alkoff has published 12 edited books and over 100 articles. Her writings have appeared in the New York Times, Eon, the New, New York Independent, among others. For over a decade, she has taught courses on decolonial philosophy and epistemology in Spain, Australia, and South Africa. She was elected president of the American Philosophical Association in 2012. In 2021, she was named by academicinfluence.com as one of the 10 most influential philosophers today. And in 2023, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is originally from Panama. And if you're interested in learning more about her work, you can find that at www.alcoff.com. And with that, uh, I turn it over to you, Prof. Um, and I'll give you 20 minutes. And I'll also let you know via the chat when you have about five minutes left. And thank you so much. Thank you. That's a really nice introduction. I appreciate all the plugs there. Um, how's the sound? Is the sound uh, good for you guys? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Um, well, I don't want you to miss Lewis Gordon. You must not miss Lewis Gordon. <laughs> um, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. Uh, again, apologize about the, um, the delay. Uh, I guess it's partly my end and partly your end, but th these things happen. So I'm just going to give you the gist of the key argument of this paper, and that'll probably be all you need. Um, and then if we have a minute to discuss it, it would be great. What I'm focusing on here is Eurocentrism as a form of ethnocentrism. So ethnocentrism takes different forms. But I want to focus on Eurocentrism, and I want to call out Eurocentrism as a form of ethnocentrism. It's a form of, of the substantive practices of epistemology of ignorance, which I know you've been discussing over the last couple of days. Um, so it is, um, it's, a, it's a form of that, in my view, that um, is not an absence, but an actual intentional <laughs> conscious practice. And I'm defining Eurocentrism here, not simply as a focus on European texts or European philosophy, but Eurocentrism is the view that it is justifiable to have an exclusive academic philosophical focus on European philosophy, that it's okay that a department only offers tradition, you know, the, the canonical texts from the Western European tradition. That doesn't make it a bad philosophy department. It's just, you know, happens to be um, the focus of that department. So I think that's the view that we have to 
criticize and unpack and understand. And that's what I'm trying to do here. What makes it justifiable? What are the assumptions involved that are necessary to make it justifiable to own study European canonical texts? That's what this talk is about. And one way this happens is that um, Western, philosoph Western trained philosophers who are all over the world, they're not just in the West, of course, Western trained philosophers are trained that um, if, if you're going to justify teaching or reading non what's classified as non-Western philosophy, it has to pass a test. It has to be different from Western philosophy, because if it's not different, then why read it? We can just read Western philosophy. So it, it has to be established as having something distinct and unique. And it also has to be intelligible to the readers who are Western trained readers. So it has to pass those two tests. It has to be distinct and it has to be intelligible. But the question is, who is judging its distinctness? right? Who is going to be judging whether or not it is different? Because that is a philosophical task, right? Judging the distinctness of an idea and comparing ideas between different cultural philosophical traditions is itself a philosophical task. And if it's only Western trained folks who are doing the judging, then you know this is the way we don't get anywhere. Um, Enrique Dussel, I've heard from leading leftist philosophers in New York um, that Enrique Dussel is derivative, right? That there's nothing new in Enrique Dussel's work. That that's the sort of idea. So um, what I want to argue here is that um, uh, the form of Eurocentrism that's in philosophy manifests itself as a part of, in relationship to an even larger pathology that I wanna call the transcendentalist delusion. And this is the sort of the key claim. The transcendentalist delusion is the idea that a belief can be separated from its genealogy, from its specific embodied geohistorical location that you can just you know take the ideas of Kant or take the ideas of Hegel and the ideas stand on their own you don't need to read them in the context of their source uh, either the writer or the culture um, this is to, the idea of taking the ideas um, and it, to transcend their source the ideas uh, rise above their source. Um, and, you know, philosophers will allow that ideas, we need intellectual history to tell us that source, to tell us a story about the genealogy, but that's intellectual history. That's not philosophy. If you're doing philosophy, you can take the ideas out of their um, location and assess them, interpret them, judge them, and argue over them in that way. And this is a mistake. Um, and I want to connect this to another important decolonial idea, which is that, um, which you can get from, you know, the work of Walter Mignolo and, and a number of others, which identifies this idea that I'm going to talk about as beginning with um, the Spanish and Portuguese conquest of the Americas in 1492. So 500 years ago. So the ways in which they are beginning to categorize the, the peoples of the new world that they encounter is on the basis of whether or not they are Christians or heathens. So those are the two categories, Christians or heathens. But you have to look at how they're defining the word heathen. So the word heathen is defined, and this goes back actually to the Greeks, as um, not self. So in the in the for the for the Spanish and the Portuguese Christians, a heathen in the New World meant someone who's not Christian. So in other words, the distinction is between those who are Christians 
and those who are not Christians. And those who are not Christians were classified as barbarians who um, did not have uh, a religion, right? They're simply barbarians. Um, so the idea is that you have those who have rationality, who have culture, have traditions, who have religion, who have relationship with God, and then you have those who don't. So you're defining the other in this instance as a negation. You're not defining the other as a substance, as having a different religion, as having a different view. And, and it's interesting because not all cultures operate in this way. The Inca, for example, and also those who followed Islam saw the possibility of multiple religions, multiple conceptualizations of God, multiple religious practices. They recognized the existence of other religions. And they, you know, in, the, in Islam, they continue to recognize the existence of other religions. But Christianity in the 15th century and 16th century certainly did not. And so it created this bifurcation between self and not self, Christian and not Christian. And what many of us argue today is that is that formula that continues to infect um, the West and to bolster Eurocentrism. So think about the definition of philosophy. There are those people who do philosophy and those people who do not do philosophy. And the people who do not do philosophy, we might, we might call it ethno-philosophy sometimes or folk wisdom or wisdom teaching. You know, there's another set of terms that are sometimes used today, but the essential term for philosophers is that it is not philosophy. So if you're interested in reading philosophy, all you need to read is the philosophy that's in the category of philosophy. You might read the wisdom teachings or the ethno philosophy for your own edification, but you don't need to read it to do philosophy because it is defined as other than philosophy. So this, this kind of Eurocentrism is what has justified a restriction of the canon to Western philosophy exclusively. Um, and I want to, you know, I, you know, I think the problem here, I'm trying to skip, skip forward a lot, um, is this obviously creates epistemic injustice toward non-European societies. And this perpetuates the idea of the intellectual superiority of European American philosophy. You don't read the other philosophy, you don't know what its challenges are to this other kind, to the European a canon. So we need the solution to this problem is to develop as Leopold Ozea and Dussel and Kwame and Kruma and others have argued for more than a century, actually. Um, we need to have greater reflexive capacities as a part of the normal work of philosophy. In particular, we need to read philosophy in context. Who is writing? Um, the geography, the history, the anthropology, the sociology, and so on, um, that will give us a fuller picture of the context and that will help us understand how to interpret the ideas, like how do we interpret Kant's declaration of the categorical imperative as universal. He never intended it to be truly universal. Um, only an analysis of the context will tell us how to actually interpret his words and understand what he was intending to say. So being reflective about the context will give us a way to interpret the, the canon and judge it and analyze it and make use of it. So I'm not arguing, I would never argue that the Western canon is useless and we should just, you know, determine its its value on the basis 
only of its context of enunciation, its source, its geographical location. That's not sufficient to determine whether or not the ideas have usefulness in another context. But that's the question that has to be asked. The ideas have meaning, the full meaningfulness of the ideas comes out in their relationship to the context. The people around you hear them, understand what the real meaning is when Kant talks about universality. Nobody at the time believed that he was really extending it in an equal way to all people. So the meanings of it were, were well understood in his context. The question is, can we take that idea and move it to another context and make it more, um, more easily functional or useful for different purposes and for our purposes? And I think the, the last thing I'll say here um, well, maybe a couple things, but is that the problem with the Eurocentric frame of self and not self, philosophy and not philosophy, is that it doesn't lend itself very easily to a perspectivism. Because um, we might think, okay, now we know European philosophy is European. That's fine. And we have European philosophy and we have African philosophy and we have Latin American philosophy just to use you know, two large categories, but um, for the moment. And we just set them alongside each other in our curriculum and everything will be fine. The problem with that uh, idea of the solution is that Eurocentrism has affected Western philosophy in such a way that it doesn't play well with others. So it doesn't acknowledge its own location or its own genealogy or its own sources or its own limits. So it has it's um it doesn't see itself, in other words, as one perspective. So to try to get um diehard Eurocentric philosophers to see European philosophy as European philosophy, right, is the challenge that we're facing today. They don't see it as European philosophy. They see it as transcendental, as universal, as talking about the human in a completely unmarked, undifferentiated way. So I think um, the work of some wonderful young historians of philosophy today are helping to correct this so we now understand John Locke's ideas about the labor theory of value as playing a, a very useful role for colonial land seizures, because in, in the Americas, particularly, the land seizures were considered justified on the grounds that indigenous people were hunter-gatherers. They didn't change the land. They didn't mix their labor with the land and thus have a right to the land because of that settlement. They weren't settling. And of course, that's not true of, of, of most indigenous folks. Only some of them were nomadic. And even those uh, made changes. But that shouldn't be the issue, right? That, sh that, that shouldn't be the grounds of the legitimation to, to territory. Um, the idea of, of many indigenous groups is that the territory is their sacred space. So their God is a mountain, their God is a river. So you move them from the mountain, you move them from the river, they can no longer express their religious practices. And this is an idea, you know, that the, the Christian thinkers in Europe uh, had no acquaintance with, um, did not understand, it did not bother to try to understand. So they saw Christianity as the religion and the other religions as, you know, fake or, or her heresy in some sense, heathenism in some sense. And they saw philosophy coming out of Europe as universal, but the thought that comes out of other parts of the world is the expression of their culture. So they could see perspectivism in regard to other parts of the world 
but not in regard to European philosophy because of the transcendental uh, illusion. So let me just um, get to uh, the, the repeat the main argument. Um, what I want to, what I'm arguing here is that Eurocentrism is more than a simply a preference for a particular tradition of philosophical thought. It's rather a practice that ensures ignorance by perpetuating the sort of epistemic injustices that came to be consolidated in many European intellectual trends during its extended effort to colonize the globe. So when we separate philosophical practice from its context, this fact of the of Eurocentrism is obscured, and this disables European own ability to be critically reflective of their tradition. It allows them to justify their exclusivity. And, you know, indeed, it justifies a rather appalling ignorance about others and other intellectual traditions. You can get a PhD in philosophy almost anywhere in the West without knowing anything about anything outside of the West intellectually. And of course, there's always been a resistance within uh, philosophy in the West and from other intellectual traditions outside the West. Within the West, feminist, post-colonial, critical race, decolonial philosophers have increased in scope and vigor but they're not entirely new, of course, because contestation of the West started in 1492, right? Decolonial theory really began uh, in written form in the 1500s and intellectual resistance began in the very beginning. Outside the West, the critique has been persistent. Decolonial thought emerged to contest Eurocentrism as soon as the conquest began, as I said. So I think um, Western philosophy has a long overdue engagement with its non-Western critics. And that is the only solution to the epistemology of ignorance. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you. So if there's any um, questions or comments, we have um, a minute. Yes, yes we, we do have about nine minutes. Um, and, and I think it is important that people uh, are able to engage with your ideas. But I just wanted to say thank you. That was very impressive that you managed to condense what I imagine is a, a much more nuanced and complex uh, a speech into a still very successful succinct um, and, and still well argued, um, but much more brief uh, speech to, today. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I do want to acknowledge that we we did uh, misprint your title in our program. Um, so it, it should have said the ignorance of Eurocentrism instead of ethnocentrism. So apologies for that. Um, but I, I think that you, you gave us so many um, um, rich ideas that also touch on and relate to so many of, of not only the keynote presentations this week, but but other presentations in the parallel sessions. Um, and, and I really hope that uh, we can open it up. Um, so I think we can take a few questions uh, or comments for Prof, uh, and, and we can have a bit of a discussion before we need to run, um, sorry, sorry, <laughs> uh, run to the shuttle. Very sorry. Is that me? So are there any questions uh, or comments in the audience? Um, and I know that there are also folks online. So if there are any questions from the online audience, you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. I know folks are quite tired uh, in the afternoon. I see a hand over here.
Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alkoff. Um, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> I just wanted to sort of explore uh, the Cartesian roots of Western philosophy and, you know, the Cartesian I in I think, therefore I am. The thinking person was always imagined to be, is always imagined, you imagine them in your own image. And so it's impossible for it to get away from, from those roots and that pervades the whole of Western philosophy from, from that moment. And it's necessarily exclusionary, um, uh, you know, and uh, and othering. Yes, um, I have a whole section on Descartes that I cut because <laughs> it really is a key figure because he's he's presented often as the start of modern epistemology. The truth of the matter is, let me just say before I get to your point, the truth of the matter is Descartes um did not think up his own ideas right we now know he studied with the jesuits and the jesuits are a very particular order within catholicism that that focus on doubt and individual reflection and there um when he was studying with the jesuits they had already spent half a century in missionary work in the new world so they had just formed in 1550, shortly after the conquest, and went over to the new to the so-called New World, and were setting up missionary camps and developing their theory of how to um, how to persuade people to become Christians, how to convert people, based on their experiences there, and um, they developed, you know, this this idea based on doubt rather than just getting them to repeat the catechism that you do this process of doubt and critical reflection but one of the questions with Descartes is why were his ideas so hugely influential and have maintained their influence over 500 years that's one of the questions that putting philosophy in context can answer for us it's not just about who came up with brilliant ideas lots of people came up with brilliant ideas but which were the ones that became the top you know the most influential ones the the ones that really made changes in society and were effective it was Descartes, and why? Because um, I think Descartes' approach is obviously, as Dussel and others have said, um, a very colonial approach because it assumes that from my singular individual positionality, I can map the entire terrain of my knowledge. I can judge it, I can categorize it, I can adjudicate differences, I can map the whole terrain. Um, so that kind of idea that from a single individual, not, not a collective, not a community, not an individual in collaboration with others, not through a dialogic encounter, right, but through the individual. And this is, of course, not really accurate in, in terms of an understanding of how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is criticized, challenged, and improved upon. It is actually always collective. It's actually always communal. But in Western epistemology, we don't have ideas about how do you know communally? How do, how do you know collaboratively? There's a lot of work in social science about collaborative research um, today, and there's some very good work on that. But epistemology still assumes that the individual is, you know, that one can take an individual point of view and do sufficient analysis of knowledge to determine whether or not a claim has, um, has justification, has plausibility, and, and I should allow it to influence me. And so that, that singularity justifies not collaborating with others, it also justifies colonizers not 
collaborating with the people that they encounter. Um, it gives enormous epistemic capacity to the individual, which is just unrealistic. I mean, the reason why we have conferences, we come to share our work, to get criticized, to develop our views. I mean, we're, intellectual work is always communal. And if it's not communal, it's not going to be very good, right? It needs the air of that communal engagement. So I I, I hope that that addresses um, your your question. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Um, I think we can do one more question. Um, and I saw a hand over here, uh, and and I'll do a, a brief question and a brief response. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Martina Um, This is Dr. Nathaniel Adam Tobias Coleman. I greatly appreciate um, <laughs> the uh, concept of a transcendental illusion, which gives me a way to name something that I've been thinking about, but I haven't had a name for. Although I do think that the name it doesn't roll off the tongue. And so, um, <laughs> um, who is the intended or appropriate audience for the argument you made um, uh, this afternoon. Who are you trying to persuade? Um, it appears to me that um, uh, on the face of it, uh, there are Anglophone so-called analytic philosophers um, and you and and they are uh, caught in this illusion and uh, you appear to suggest that it was a a challenge, maybe a key challenge, uh, that we get them to uh, drop this uh, illusion. I wonder whether that's a, a good use of your time or a good use of anyone's time. It certainly uh, seems to be the case that there are folks who are doing um, uh, philosophy differently and who have been since 1492 and before, and they'll continue doing philosophy differently. They don't need to be persuaded of this illusion. Um, if there is any target audience, I'm suggesting this to you, it's um, the generations coming up um, uh, over whose minds we are in co competition uh, with um, the uh, those who call themselves analytic, um, a competition uh, to tell uh, a more compelling story about what philosophy is or could be. So I'm actually encouraging you to um, uh, not to waste your time with the uh, uh, with the with the, not the dead, but the dying white men. No, I, I agree. I, I am not hopeful about changing the, the sort of uh, mainstream in the West. I've been fighting it for my whole 40 years <laughs> career, um, but really it's not, um, it, it, it's about power more than intellectual ideas. And they have found ways to constantly, you know, deflect these criticisms and deflect those of us who make them and marginalize us. So um, I, I don't have any illusions about that. But, you know, although I think that there, there are some people in the Western, you know, train in Western philosophy and the Western tradition that are critics inside. And so the, those arguments can be strengthened. But mainly, I think, I've been teaching, you know, uh, decolonial theory to people who want to know about decolonial theory, which is an interdisciplinary group. But we need the arguments. We need the language. We need to understand what it is that, that we're about. We need to understand what, you know, how to how to think about um, the European tradition and and our own traditions. So I I think that the ta you know that that the task is to articulate in a smart way for ourselves what we're about and why we're putting Kant in a box over here <laughs> or whatever we decide to do with Kant, what we decide to do with Kant. So, so that's, that's really my, my hope. I mean, occasionally I get invited or, you know, to be in a collection or something like that. And, um, you know, I'll I'll take that sometimes, but you're you're quite right. It is a waste of time. <laughs> Often, I I was at this conference at Oxford. Um, you weren't there. Lewis was there, uh, and you can ask him about it. In April, was it April or or May? And it was just you know, it was we we tried our we tried our best, 
Um, and I think the audience was diverse. And I think, you know, some of the audience may have heard what we were saying, but, you, can, you know, so we were speaking to some of the audience and the others, like, just as I'm over the head. <laughs> I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Tell me. Dr. Coleman is saying, <laughs> I, I said to both of y'all to keep it brief, and here I am handing off the mic. Um, we'll end, we'll end, but I, let me hear what you say. What now? Forgive me. I, I simply said a little um, naughtily that Oxford's statue of Cecil Rhodes still stands. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and thank you, thank you, Prof. Alkoff, um, and thank you so much to the audience members who have stayed. Um, and I'm I'm so very sorry that our time with you was cut short, Prof. Um, but I'm hoping that you know we in future have more time um, to hear from you and to engage with you. And we are still very much honored that that you were able to join us this afternoon. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to take your advice and we're going to try and not miss uh, Prof Gordon. And with that, we have a shuttle waiting for us. Um, but another round of applause, please, for Prof Alkoff. Can I just say, I will be in Johannesburg in January um, doing something for UNISA. So I'll be around. Maybe I'll see Wonderful. you. We'll see you in January then. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh... Prof, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence and participation. We are delighted and grateful. And colleagues, I'm not going to waste further time. Um, we are going to expand the Festival of Ideas in a few minutes at the public lecture that um, Dr. L, uh, uh, Professor L. Aragodon is going to, to present. And I really want to exhort all of us to, to be present there and participate in furthering the conversation. Once again, thank you so much for being part of this event. Thank you. Let us make our way to the, to the lecture. Mm -hmm.